Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fairfield County Scores live webinar on marketing in an uncertain world. I'm Bud Freund, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'll be your host. Our speaker today is John Dupree, and more about him in just a minute. This webinar is being done in collaboration with the Monroe Chamber of Commerce and the Monroe Library. First, some brief information about SCORE. We have about 300 offices nationwide and over 11,000 volunteers. We're part of the Small Business Administration and in Fairfield County SCORE, we have over 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry, process, and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value-added services to small business owners. First, free one-on-one -on -one counseling, these days face-to-face, -face, not so much, but telephone, email, and video, which can be accessed via the request mentor link on our website or via the link you see on the screen. Note, we are currently not doing face-to-face -face mentoring until further notice. Second, we do educational workshops and webinars, over 150 a year, as a matter of fact. And third, we have an extensive resource on our website, including subject matter experts at your disposal and information on a wide variety of topics. Uh, we have converted some of our in-person workshops to live webinars due to the national health crisis. And you can look for the specifics on fairfieldcounty.score.org. Some useful information about today's event. If you have a question, please use the Q&A window at any time during the presentation. You'll find it a uh, button for it located on the screen in Zoom. And our webinar will end at 1 p.m. to respect your time. The session is being recorded, and the link to the recording will be available at fairfieldcountyscore.org within a couple of days. Now our speaker, John Dupree, runs Calibrate Marketing in Danbury, Connecticut. John's experience combines over 20 years in sales and marketing in the B2B world with extensive technological knowledge. He develops marketing strategies for startups and small businesses that improve results and ROI in email, SEO, search engine optimization, and search and social media, including in-house mentoring and training. He holds an economics degree from Syracuse University and is a certified ISO 9000 auditor. I'll now turn it over to John. It's all yours. All right, thank you very much, Bud. I appreciate that. Um, so I will be keeping the chat window open. Um, if you have questions or want clarification on anything that I'm talking about, please just send us a chat and I'll try to address it at the moment. Uh, otherwise we'll uh, address them at the end. So I'd like to first start off by talking about uh, commerce. You know, the business that we're, that we're in, it's all about commerce and it's based on trust. Uh, the thing with commerce is that we are going to usually give money, something like uh, similar, in the hopes that what was promised to us will actually be delivered. Um, sometimes it may be better than we hoped, sometimes it may not be, but it's all started with the basis of trust that what we are uh, being told we're going to receive is what we actually get. There are some times when you have buyer's remorse uh, there are some times when you feel like it wasn't exactly how the salesperson explained it to you, uh, but there has to be some level of trust in order to have any kind of commerce. And if anyone here is a business owner, um, started their own business, they know that running it is hard. Uh, it's more than just that you're good at your trade or good at your skill. There's a number of different things that need to happen in order to have a successful business. And when you're marketing the business at the same time, as many solar entrepreneurs are, it becomes decidedly harder. So we start with a founder-driven uh, philosophy. This is our small business where the founder is uh, directly involved in every aspect of it. And the business owner usually is the one who is driving most of the marketing activity. So when you first started off, 
uh, you're going to be the one that does all of the marketing, um, the communications, the understanding the products, and getting people to get to that level of trust that they will feel confident to purchase from you. So the first rule is trust, and that means being authentic. Um, one of the reasons why many small business owners feel that uh, business is, is doing well when they first start off is because the owner is directly involved and they are genuine, they're passionate, they have a deep level of caring because it's their business, their livelihood uh, that they're doing. When you, the business starts to grow and now you start to hire people who are going to be your salespeople or your marketing people or your social media person or your email marketing, that level of passion, that level of caring starts to drop off because the person is no longer fully invested the same way. Uh, it isn't there, it's a job. So uh, when, when we start to grow, we need to make sure that that authenticity, that that continues throughout, um, whether it's the owner or if it's uh, some uh, work, coworker, employee. The second rule of trust is that there's a service that's, that is fulfilling a deep need. This means that the people who are uh, going to be purchasing, the clients and the prospects, that they have a need that what is being provided, the service is actually able to, to resolve it. it uh, fixes it for them. And um, if you are able to address what the needs are that people may have and how it is addressed or show examples of, of times when you have resolved uh, those needs for others, that builds that level of trust. So when you first start off, it's a lot of networking. It's just going out there, meeting people, uh, doing your chamber meetings, uh, going out to score uh, sessions. Um, different things that are going to be face-to-face uh, -face so that you're able to uh, introduce yourself and find out more about who's out there. And what you're trying to do is find somebody who may have a need for your service. As you start to grow with that, um, you can't spend all your time because at some point you have to start delivering on that service. So then you start um, looking at you know, getting referrals, having the people that you're networking instead of them being your immediate customers, that they are also out there uh, referring you. Uh, you and referring clients to you. Uh, so the main source for new business for many, many of the small businesses is referrals. Um, and if they have built that level of trust and people like them and people want to uh, you know, want to help them, they'll be out there referring and they'll be uh, seeing people coming and saying, oh, so-and-so referred me to, me to you. Or they'll get a call saying, hey, I, I met somebody who I think would be a good uh, person for you. And again, it's really the founder who's getting most of that information. Uh, most of those new referrals and new business. And as you can imagine, as that grows, uh, it becomes tougher and tougher to be able to handle the referrals as easily as you had in the past. Um, it's a lot of handholding, a lot of face time in order to make sure that uh, you're treating each person as their own unique uh, prospect. So it starts to grow to a point that you need to get into some kind of advertising, uh, basically a mass advertising. So rather than working one-to-one -one and getting your message to them, you start to use uh, ads that people are able to see where they are. Um, it may be billboards in the past. Uh, it was radio and TV. Uh, now we start getting into uh, newspapers and magazines, and then it's on to um, when they're attending webinars or when they're on their Netflix ads. Uh, YouTubes and things along these lines. So advertising is basically just to get that one message out to as many people as possible. And all of this is to try to get to what we call an MQL. It's a marketing qualified lead. It's somebody who has a need or should have a need, they may not realize it yet, where you can help. And ideally you want it that that person somehow has expressed an interest to engage with you. But you're not cold calling them, uh, you're not knocking on their door like a vacuum salesperson from old, that you're able to actually uh, reach out and uh, they will know who you are and say, ah, yes, I was hoping to hear from you. Or um, they may not express it quite that, that vocally, but they're interested to, to have a discussion with you and uh, see how you can help. And they may say, I want to half inch drill, or they may say, yes, I was looking to talk to you because I want this product or this service that you offer. But in reality, what they need is that half inch hole. Um, they don't want the drill just because it's pretty and show it all around. When you start getting to some of the luxury goods, maybe then, yes, they wanna have that Maserati or that uh, you know, special uh, handbag because just having it uh, fulfills that emotional need that they have. But typically people are looking for a product or service because they have some need that that product or service would be able to fill. And if we're able to address those needs, 
and be able to talk about them, uh, then they will have a better understanding about what it is that they're going to be purchasing. Many companies that I work with, I tell them that we don't want to focus on the product specs. Um, we don't want to talk about the tolerances and the manufacturing rates and so forth. We want to talk about what it does uh, and what can we guarantee that it will do for somebody. So when we're at that point where they say, you know, I'm looking for a drill, we don't want to start talking about, oh, we have this drill and that drill and these products and so forth. We want to talk to them about what's the change that they're looking to see? What is it that they are hoping to have happen when they purchase this product or service? And then if there are other people who have been needing to go through that same change and I've helped them out, been able to work with them, we tell that story. This is how we handle someone who is in a similar situation. This is what we were able to offer to them. So we tell the story. And again, the best salespeople out there, they're all storytellers. So when they sit down face to face, when they uh, are on the phone with somebody, they're able to talk to them about the story, find out what it is that person is needing, what the change that they're looking for, and then they tell the story of how what they are offering is able to do that. Uh, so what we like to do in a marketing world is that we want to create the stories that help educate the prospective audiences. We want to get them to the point that they're able to make good decisions on what they're purchasing. We don't wanna have the buyer's remorse. Uh, it may be that they go with a, uh, a purchase that's not ours because ours is not the best solution or doesn't fit correctly with them. But that person, if they're being uh, told that you know, they, it would be better if they did one with this uh, solution rather than ours, that person will have a high level of trust uh, in you and they will be referring you and they will be talking with other people about you. So. One of the things that we uh, want to always make sure of is that you know, we're educating them so that they can make the best decision, even if it's not exactly what we want them to be doing. Um, we may not want them to you know, be purchasing a uh, someone else or holding off and not making the purchase yet. Um, but when they do uh, decide to make the purchase with us, it will be a much more valid purchase for them. So in the old school, uh, the way that we used to do sales and marketing is that we would always tell people, you have two ears and one mouth, you need to listen. Listen carefully, find out what their needs are, be able to then come up with a story that tells how we can satisfy that need or if we can't, how someone else can. Listening was the biggest to the best skill set that any sales or marketing person had. And unfortunately, prospecting <laughs> finding those leads and talking with them and helping them to become uh, more educated that has all changed. Uh, it's been changing for a couple of decades now, slowly over time, with the uh, rise of the internet and the always on uh, able to search. Uh, if people don't need to have that face-to-face -face meeting quite as much. They can have uh, phone conversations. They can be talking anytime, uh, through that, or we can be doing talks through Zoom and such. Um, so the prospecting process has changed quite a bit. Back in the uh, 70s and 80s, when we talked about what was the best marketing tool, people would always say Yellow Pages. Uh, the Yellow Pages was the best tool. Every small business, every local business needed to be on the Yellow Pages. That's where all the prospects went to find something. And the Yellow Pages were pretty smart when they first came out. They would not only give you uh, an ad in the page, in the Yellow Pages, but they would put a phone uh, actually in your office. And that phone was the, the uh, direct number that was printed in the yellow pages. And they would do this for you know, six months or a year. And at the end of the six months or a year, they say, okay, we're going to take that phone out now. Um, and people say, no, that's the one that rings. I want to keep that phone. Uh, I want to keep that ad in the yellow pages and I want to keep that phone because that's the one that rings. Well, that has all switched over to search. Um, people now uh, will go to Google or to Bing. They'll do their search. They'll find their category. They'll find their information. Every customer journey now is starting at search in one way or another. The next thing that has changed is that this mass advertisement, uh, where we're putting up the billboards and we're putting up uh, the TV ads and the radio ads, that has become much more personalized so that uh, we're able to do advertisements that are very focused on what somebody's current interest is. These are targeted search ads or that people who have some uh, kind of, uh, their, um, they've expressed an interest or they're familiar in a, uh, with similar to some other type of person that does business with us, those are social, social media ads. So we can target uh, through search or through social that if somebody is searching for our competitor or if someone's searching for this, then we wanna show our ad there. 
we can target that. If somebody has just said they got married, uh, we can now target them with buying a house or uh, finding a real estate agent or all the things that are associated with that. We can all do that through social ads. The last thing that uh, has really changed is that word of mouth recommendations. While they still do happen, most of it's been replaced by social media posts. Um, instead of people going and talking to uh, you know, their friends and their neighbors and their family members and saying, do you know a good baker or do you know a good, uh, someone, someone who's a good hairdresser? They will go on onto social media and they'll put a uh, looking for a testimony or looking for someone nearby in the social media world will respond with all the different people that they know that they would recommend. So our prospecting channels now, um, we have the paid prospecting channels. These are through social media boosts or through ads. We have the recommendations that happen uh, either through uh, referrals or reviews. We have search, which is the biggest one. And that's usually will end up going to your website or to a blog or what I call niche content. And then we have shared, which is when someone has seen a social media post and they like or share it, or if somebody has received an email and then they share it with other people. So those are really the four main ways that we find prospects now. Um, there still is or had been some face-to-face -face, uh, going out and networking, doing your BNIs, doing your social, your, um, your uh, chamber of commerce, but that's much less for finding a new prospect as much as it is uh, staying front of mind with people um, and uh, being able to uh, bounce things off of people, test out different marketing messages and really work with the, uh, the relationships so that um, there's some referrals and reviews that are coming in, or referrals coming in uh, through that network. So the new way for prospects is that they are going to self-learn. Um, they don't call and say, can you tell me more information about this? Or I have this situation, how can you help? Uh, they will go online and they will do all the learning themselves. Uh, you will do the searches, they'll look at reviews, they'll look at, for uh, references, they'll see who uh, has the capabilities they're looking for, and they'll figure it out themselves exactly what we want um, or what, they're, what they want. And then they'll decide to reach out to find out where can I get this service or does uh, what is available actually match up to everything that I've looked for online. Well, that was the start of people using uh, screen time to find things, but with COVID, it's become all screen time. Um, you know, now, when we had COVID and uh, the work from home and uh, the shutdown, everybody, their only access to connect with their friends and other family members and so forth was all using the screen. I don't know if your house looked like this, but uh, even now, my house still is the same. My kids are, you know, they come home and they get onto their iPads and they get onto their computers. I'm usually on my computer or on my phone. My wife is on her computer. And, uh, even though we're all in the same room, we do a lot more communicating through text messaging than we do uh, talking face to face. And this has really become, um, the, you know, the, the normal uh, now. Uh, if you remember a few years ago, we used to talk about what was a reasonable amount of screen time that a child should have, you know, one hour a day or two hours a day, uh, TV or computer and such. And that's all been thrown out the window. Um, now it's, it's the norm is for people to be on their screens. And what's happened is that in the, um, the last year and a half, two years, we've taken technology and we've accelerated the introduction of it, the acceptance of it in our society. So what we had been projecting was going to happen in 2025 and 2030 has now happened immediately. So our comfort level with doing video conferencing and being able to see ourselves in, in this tiny little window and such, we really never thought that was going to become very comfortable or very reasonable um, until around you know, another five or 10 years from now. There is discussions and, and, and companies that are trying out doing uh, virtual reality. Um, there are concerts that are happening in the uh, the uh, VR world now. So uh, people are putting on their headsets and they're going in as a, uh, you know, to their, uh, their gaming and they'll have a, a concert that happens inside there. Uh, Facebook is spending tons of money on doing the uh, 3D and virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, so we're seeing more and more of this uh, interaction happening. Uh, the whole back to work uh, and hybrid work environment is talking about you know, how do we incorporate people who are working from home with the people who are working in the office and making it so that they're getting the same experience out of that. Um, that was not something that we would normally have thought um, back in 2018, 2019, uh, as you know, something that we'd be you know, talking about in 2021. So technology and society, and therefore marketing, 
marketing because marketing is just really responding to uh, the technology and society needs. It's gone through an unprecedented changes in a very short time. Um, it's amazing actually how well we've adapted uh, to this, this world. Um, for all of the, the um, concerns you've had about you know, having to be at home and you know, uh, what's going on with the, you know, the world and with COVID, and stuff, most of us um, are still having some semblance of a, you know, a normal life um, in one form or another. And some of these changes has been the fact that mobile uh, has uh, picked up, the high-speed internets uh, picked up. You know, we have uh, some of the things talking about in um, the uh, infrastructure plan about getting fast and high-speed internet to every single uh, house in America. And there's also big data, uh, which is crunching down all the things that we do and delivering to us you know, exactly what it is that I want, not what everyone in my neighborhood wants or not what everybody in my town wants. It's very, very personalized. Um, and being able to go through uh, with YouTube or Netflix or uh, Amazon Prime and find exactly the story and message that I'm looking for, um, it's amazing. And then from there, they make the recommendations based off of that. Um, and then the artificial intelligence coming out and how that is now making judgments based upon, you know, in the past when we saw people do A, B, and C, they then did D. So I'm going to, you know, the computer says, I'm going to present you with D because it, you'll probably do that. And it does that without any uh, anybody putting in, you know, please do D uh, for the person. Okay. So all digital all the time. Um, and the trust in digital interactions has greatly accelerated. I remember uh, back in the early 2000s talking about uh, being able to communicate with somebody, you know, that I could uh, give them, you know, a video of the product or show them uh, what we were doing uh, virtually. And they said, no, um, you know, I need to meet you. I need to see it face to face. I need to touch it, feel it, you know, really understand how it works. That's changed quite drastically now. Um, part of it has changed because we also offer guarantees and you know free exchanges and returns and if it doesn't meet your needs and lots of ways to take care of that uh, the concern they may have that maybe what I was saying wasn't exactly what they would receive, but for the most part the digital interaction has been uh, accepted as that's just as good as a handshake. Uh, and what gets crazy is that where we used to trust only our neighbors and our friends and family for reviews. Now we'll trust strangers. You know, go onto Amazon, you'll see how many people reviewed and said yes, this was good or not, and how many stars. That, you know, we don't know who those people are, but we trust that much more so than um, if it, it wasn't there. So that trust is all gone online. Um, and everything that's in the marketing and the sales funnel has to be converted and taken online. So uh, any, you know, if you look at how you used to sell and how you used to market, how you used to find prospects. Uh, how you used to communicate to them what, what, what it is that uh, your products and services can do, find out what their needs are, uh, what the pricing is going to be. All of that has to be able to be delivered online now. Um, that's, that's the expectation uh, from the prospects, from the audiences. And here's the example of a review. Um, most customers, if they see that there's a 3.6 out of 5 uh, star rating, they probably won't consider the business, even though uh, the five stars are much, much higher than the four stars and the one stars. Also with this is that if all as they saw were five stars, uh, meaning that every single person out there uh, had done a five star rating, they probably wouldn't consider that as well because they wouldn't trust it. You know, they know that somebody, somebody would be a little disappointed, would give a four star or somebody would just you know, out of spite give a one star or something. Okay. The other part of it is that um, they, our customers, they want to have the information delivered to them when they want it, whether that is at nine o'clock in the morning or at 11.30 at night. Uh, and it needs to be able to be seen on the device that they have, whether that's their laptop, their large screen TV, uh, their mobile device, their tablet. And what they, you know, they want it to be easy uh, so that when they uh, receive that information, they don't have to think about how to how to view it or where to move, that it uh, converts over very easily so it's, it can be seen. So um, we originally had created websites that were made for the tablet or the desktop computer. And then we would make up a mobile version of that site that would be stripped down, not quite as much information, made it simpler and easier to see on a phone. Then we created uh, that change over to what's called responsive, which is that it was taking that desktop um, website and then repackaging it so that it would fit on the phone correctly. Usually that meant going from a two or three column style website to then a single column that could be seen on the, on the phone. 
And now what people are talking about is what's called mobile first, which means it's a website that's designed for the phone and then it will convert over to the desktop. And the reason for that is that more people are, are viewing the websites on their phone. And so we want that to be the optimal experience. And if you happen to go onto your desktop or your laptop or your tablet, then it will convert over, but that's not really what the websites are designed for the best viewing. So the buyer's journey, it always starts with a question. Um, so I might say, okay, um, we're sitting out on the patio. I wish I had music out here. What are the best outdoor Bluetooth speakers? Um, they may start off saying, what are the best outdoor speakers? And then they start hearing, oh, there's wired speakers and there's Bluetooth speakers. Oh, okay, what are the best Bluetooth speakers? And from there, they'll look at reviews and they'll uh, do more searches in the search engine. They'll watch videos, they'll read the blog or the niche content. And they say, okay, so the best speakers really have to have the best bat, uh, base and treble. So they start doing a question for that. And then they'll search through, again and look at some expert websites and product pages, really dig into the reviews now to find out which product uh, really does it. And they find out, okay, Bose, do they have the best Bluetooth speakers? So who, where can I get them? And they'll search for now, where can I find this specific product? Now it goes through the, uh, the brand website, it may go to a distributor website, it may go to a Google map um, location. And it says, okay, best buy. They're the ones that, that carry them and have the best price. So where's the nearest best buy and is it open now? So this was their whole journey. They did it all online. Um, and then when they came time to, to go purchase, sometimes now they're even just placing the purchase on uh, online and they're just driving in and someone will drop it into their car and they'll drive home. Um, they're really being contactless, uh, meaning, you know, easing the friction, uh, the, the holdups that happen. You know, I don't have to wander around the store and find it. I don't have to carry it to the cashier. I don't have to wait in line for the cashier. I don't have to have to come up with cash to give to the cashier or have them wait for them to come up with change. I don't have to carry anything. Um, so removing all of that friction uh, to the to purchase makes it very easy to go make a purchase. And people talk about, you know, what are some of the things that came in from COVID that are going to stay? Well, anything that made it easier, that's going to stay. So in general, when we look at the buyer's journey, we have the initial awareness, then they have some consideration, they start making some decisions, they qualify those decisions, and then they'll eventually make a purchase. Um, and so they go through, you know, whether it's for looking at a pack of gum or purchasing a car, they go through all five of these steps. Some of them are quick, some of them take a long time to do, um, but it's, each one of these five steps has to happen. And, in the past, it was our marketing, our salespeople that would go in and would explain all of this uh, to, the, to the person. They would talk about the consideration, help them with the decision. They qualify and say, how, you know, how do we compete against the competitors? Um, they make it easy to make the purchase. But now, because people are so used to doing everything online and because it's easier and faster, now they want to be able to do all of these steps online uh, as easily as possible. And if your business doesn't have this information online available, it's gonna make it very difficult for someone to continue the journey with you. Um, if they now know that they have to come into the store and they have to call you to get this information, you know, they may still do it, but they probably have already looked at two or three other people that they may not have looked at in the first place. So a lot of times they'll start with search where they know nothing about you. They may read some information online, read a white paper. Now they know something about who you are or what you're offering. They do some research, they compare your offers to other people. And then the first contact that you'll have with them is when they call for a quote or to guide them through the purchasing. Um, and this is where they're really comparing you to others. And now they wanna know, you know, is everything I'm seeing online, is it being matched up to you know, what someone is telling me? And at the end of it, they order, they make the appointment, they get scheduled demo, they become a buyer. Okay. So the buyer's journey, um, we have to now guide them without knowing who it is. So we have to create uh, these journeys that people will be able to take in uh, whether they are someone who is brand new to our needs or they are somebody who has been uh, a repeat purchaser. We have to create a journey that is available online for them to be able to do. So some of the things that we look at is figuring out, you know, uh, when they're on their buyer's journey, they're going to want to know, can, you, can we solve the problem that they're having? Can we, can we uh, fix the need? How much does it cost? And is it worth it? Uh, why should they buy from us compared to anybody else? 
what's the, our unique offering? Um, we used to talk about our unique selling feature. But it's, it's really, it's what's unique about what we are offering or is it really a commodity? If it's a commodity, it's gonna be a price game and no, no, no business owner wants to be caught up in a price game. Um, so you really want to come up with what's the unique offering that you're doing. It may be that faster delivery or better guarantee or, uh, you know, that, that just your customer service is better um, or that your, the customer experience and the follow-up is better. Um, you want to find out who's influencing the decision, um, meaning that, you know, as the person who's gathering this information or taking on journey, are they the one who's actually the decision maker or the one who has the final say? Um, quite often, you know, when I was in insurance sales, we used to say, you know, don't have a meeting with just one of the, uh, the household members. Make sure all of the members are there because they're all going to be involved in the decision uh, and we need, to, we need to talk with them. So we want to make sure that we're addressing uh, everybody who might be involved in the decision. And then what is the timing for a solution? Um, you know, how long does it take to do it? Because time is money. And if something comes in next week versus something's going to come in in two months, that's going to be a big difference in terms of making the decision. Um, you know, one of the things when I talk with uh, companies that are from Europe, understanding the American mindset, uh, we talk about, you know, the Americans will go and say, what's available right now? Because I need it for Super Bowl on Sunday. Um, where in Europe, they'll say, this is what I'm looking for. How long will it take for me to order it? Then I'll place my order, figuring out how long it will take. Um, so it's a two, totally different process that we go through. So when we start trying to figure out who our ideal prospect is, our ideal uh, customer, we want to look at our top 10 clients. You know, from the last you know, two years, who are the top 10 clients that we had? And look at what problems did they have? Um, what are the solutions that they saw, both our, the ones that you're offering as well as what any of the competitors are offering? And why did they choose you uh, to, to go for those solutions? Um, you know, what were the decision process for what they, you know, what they looked at and saw? Was it that you were the best price or you're, you're the one who answered the phone or called them back? Uh, is it that you had the best product out there um, or the best pictures of the products? Yeah. Also, what were their expectations and were they met? Um, you know, what were some of the things that they found that surprised them once they engaged in your service or got your product? And then what did those clients think about doing business with you? Um, were there things that they enjoyed about doing business with you or are there things that they could have been fixed uh, about it? So all of these things we'll look at and from here, we'll try to come up with our marketing messages to go out there. Um, by, if, what we're hoping is that by identifying and describing these, these uh, issues that it attracts people who are very similar to who our top 10 clients are. And this is what gets us to what's called a sales qualified lead. So a marketing qualified lead is somebody who may have an information for you. A sales qualified lead, uh, it becomes somebody who uh, definitely is uh, in the place of purchase. And I use a term called Banty uh, for evaluating the leads that we have. And that means uh, it talks about a budget, authority, needs, timing, and the impression. And since we all like to have numbers to work with to try to figure out who to, uh, you know, what the scale is, uh, okay. I'm sorry, I just saw a question from uh, Deb asking, are the sales available for download? Uh, they will be available uh, online uh, at the SCORE website. Um, so we have the, uh, the budget authority needs timing and impression, and we apply a, uh, a weighted value to each one of these. I usually start off with saying each one is worth 20%. So if I was um, perfect across the board, I would have 100% probability of winning the sale. So Banty, the budget, um, I break that down to five stages. And in case it may be that stage one, I have no idea if they have a budget. Stage two is that they don't use a budget. They'll have to get approval. Stage three is that they have an idea, but it's not realistic. They think that my Maserati is only going to cost them $20,000. Um, they may have a range that's realistic, or they have a budget set for the uh, amount that we're going to be quoting. They know exactly how much it's going to cost. And because each one of these is worth 20%, I usually start off with that. Each scale here is worth 4%. So if I have no idea, it's only worth 4% towards the opportunity. But if they have a budget that's for the set amount, that's worth a full 20. It's four times five, 20%. For authority is, uh, do they have the authority to make the decision? If they're just gathering uh, information, no idea who, they're th who is the uh, final decision maker, that's a one. If they're the assistant to decision maker, that's a two. If they're part of the decision committee, if they're, you know, part of, it's a, a, a husband and wife and it's, it's just talking to the husband, they're part of the decision committee. 
Um, if I've known and met all members of this decision committee, that puts them at a four. And if I'm talking to the primary decision maker, that's a five for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, then I look at what is their need. You know, are they collecting info for their files? They haven't really shared with me what their need is. They're just saying, I just want information about this product. Uh, if they've been tasked to look into it, so they kind of have an idea what their need is, but somebody else told them, hey, go find out what the uh, you know, cost of the TVs are going to be. Um, if there's a definite project, uh, but the scope is really unknown, you know, they're looking for um, you know, a uh, you know, life insurance, but we really don't know how many people, you know, what they're looking to do with it and such. If there's an RFP, that's a request for uh, proposals in process, meaning that they have scoped out pretty clearly what it is they need. Uh, and they're looking for people to be able to examine that and say, yes, I can offer that. And the last one would be if a specific product is specified, meaning that they want my product. Uh, they want Bose Bluetooth speakers. Um, and I'm, I work for Bose. So you know, that would be a product specified number five. So, timing of the opportunity. You know, is it uncertain timing? We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. If it's on the horizon, there's no set date. They could do it fast, they could do it slow. There could be a project that's developing in a year. You know, they know, okay, I'm looking for a house because we're you know, in the process of getting married. So I know within the next year or so, I'm, I'm gonna be looking for a house. If they're just starting to budget and develop the project, or trying to figure out you know, how much is gonna be, and I, I need to put together my time frame. But the last part is that, yep, I have a set time frame. We're getting married on, on, on March and I wanna be in the house by April. And the last one is the I, the impression of my company. So how do they feel about me and, or my business or such? Um, if I'm uncertain how they feel, that's a one. If it's a competitive bid, meaning that yeah, you know, you're invited to, to talk and talking to a bunch of different people, that's great. If they actually tell me who they're talking with, it's one of many people uh, and, and these are who I consider to be competitors, then that would be a three. If I'm one of three that they're looking at, this happens a lot in the business world, in the government world, they'll say, um, you know, we need three sources, three bids, or if it's a single source, I mean, I'm the only one offering it, then, you know, that gives us a five. So all of these things combined, so it has, you know, three um, for the budget, a three for authority, a four for need, four for timing, a three for uh, impression, add that all up together, it comes up to 68% project probability. This is what we call sales enablement. And it helps us to know where should we be focusing uh, our, our time and attention, but it also helps us to deliver a message that we would come up with, what do we need to get the budget from stage two to stage three? What information do we have to provide in order for someone to get to that next stage? What do we need to get them for our impression of our company from a stage four to stage five? Um, you know, what is it unique about us and so forth? So each stage on there, we have a message or a, or a journey that we would create, and we would make sure that that's available to the person uh, when they're going through their evaluation so that they could be able to make a right, a reasonable and rational um, decision. So we talk about you know, what is out there now in the digital world, and it's, it's a, a number of different things. We don't have to do all of them, but you, know, you need to have a website, um, some search engine optimization, local uh, business uh, uh, maps listing if you're local, Facebook if you're dealing with consumers, email, email because that, no matter what people say, that is still the best uh, return on investment. Uh, maybe on LinkedIn if it's a business to business, maybe on Twitter if it has to do with timing or social uh, issues, or if you're a, um, you know, a public speaker, uh, Pinterest if you are involved in any kind of visual um, interior design, uh, furniture, something like that. Instagram, if you are, um, again, working with a visual and younger crowd. Snapchat, if you're working with a very young crowd. Uh, YouTube and, um, and, and TikTok for the visual aspects of it. So you get all these different things. And they all will direct traffic back to your website. So people may be on TikTok or Facebook or so forth, and they see uh, some information about you, and they click on it, and it comes to your website to, to learn more information about it. The website also tells people where they can find us. Uh, they can find us here and here and here. And so they, someone happens to come to the website, they may say, oh, I'm going to follow you on Facebook or sign you up for your email newsletter. And then all these things work together and communicate around each other. So this is kind of you know, the, the core of how you're going to communicate and different pieces of it you may use and not use. These are the, the tools that you use. And there's lots of people out there that offer uh, you know, getting you set up and running and managing these tools. The problem is that you could have these tools, but you don't really know what you're saying 
on that. So you need some kind of strategy. And that strategy is then, uh, you know, goes on the website and you generate the content and you analyze the, how people respond to that content and that forms your SEO. Um, you know, what are your keywords and what are your listings that you're doing? Pushes you out to social media, which platform you need to be on, email marketing. Then you can get into paid lead generation, which is the paid ads, things like this. Sales enablement, uh, which is like what we've been talking about in terms of scoring our, our prospects and figuring out where attention should go and what messaging needs to happen. Improving your customer experience, using a CRM, a customer relationship management system, and then using some automation to really make this push through. So there's a lot of things that as you get bigger and bigger, um, you know, it, you can run in, you, know, you, you uh, end up using more and more of these tools. But for a lot of small businesses, you start thinking about all of this and it gets overwhelming. So, you know, what's the marketing strategy that's really going to be the, 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 the ticket to win, you know, and, you know, most com companies out there, they have their website, they have some niche content, um, that maybe their blog or the frequently asked questions or case studies or something like this, and that's generating their email content that they're sending out to, to keep uh, people informed of what they're doing. They may have ads that's sending traffic into them. And they may have uh, you know, information on YouTube or Pinterest or Twitter or some social media or referrals that send people to your website. So you have to pick and choose which ones to go with. Um, and sometimes people will say, okay, I wanna go with paid ads, but they haven't really optimized their website to get the best out of it. There's a lot of waste that can happen depending on where you're going with it. So this next one might scare you a little bit, but what we look at is these are all the different things that it takes from uh, a one man uh, business all the way up to some of the Fortune 500s. And you wanna look at what you're doing based upon what you have in place already because they build off of each other. So we usually start with the green items first. Um, gotta get those all set up, your website, your analytics, your content program, what your story is gonna be, your search optimization, social media platforms, email marketing. And it, it's, you know, as you go down the list, you start adding more and more to it. And then we start getting into the blue. So once you've optimized that information, then the greens, then you move into the blue areas and start focusing on those. And then eventually you get into the red areas. Um, and part of it has to do with how big your business is, what your resources are. But this is the, the, the path to grow over one year, five year, you know, 10 year period you know, to grow up to that point. And what you should see is that your marketing activity is generating business. Um, that all the greens is pretty stable and steady through there. As you start adding more of the blues, you start to get a little bit more exponential growth happening. And when you get into the red areas, then it really starts to expand. So these are all the different ways um, that, you know, that you're gonna use these. Um, and by putting them all together, you're gonna get web conversions and you're gonna higher quality traffic. And then you're gonna get a consistent ideal customer uh, when, you're, when you're going out to the top with it. Okay. So um, I work with customers for helping them with strategy, getting them set up on tools, so forth. I have a partner, uh, Seaver Interactive. They do more of the hands-on um, in terms of building the websites, in terms of doing the email marketing and social media. So if all this stuff isn't been scary to you and you want to just hand it off to somebody, I recommend work, uh, working with Seaver. Um, I have a question on here about, uh, do we really need a website today? Uh, can you just work through a third party like Google? So if you're first starting off, uh, you may find that you can create uh, you know, a, a online presence on with your Google local listing or with an Etsy page or uh, something like this. But that's what we call it's a third party and they change the rules often. So if all your business uh, back, you know, your, your, your operations is based upon some third party solution and they change the rules on you, you suddenly are out of business. Um, you have to revamp drastically. So uh, while people will say, you know, I just want to use a Google property or my, my, my local listing or something like that to get started with it. Um, it's just a starting point. Uh, then you want to want to move into something that you own or that is, is definitely you. Uh, this also is in terms of what your, um, you know, what your, um, your impression will be. Uh, if somebody comes and sees you and you're on a, just a Google page listing, and then they see here's a competitor and they have a fully laid out website with a lot of content that obviously they spend a lot of time and attention and so forth. And they have people who are dedicated to that. Well, we all live by the how I do one thing is how I'll do everything uh, philosophy, which means that if I see that someone's put the time and energy into their website and it's really professional looking, I'm going to assume everything they do is going to take that time and energy and really professional. Or if I see someone has just put a, you know, a Google listing together, 
oh, maybe that's you know, they're new to the business or they really don't spend a lot of time or energy on that. And I don't know if they're gonna spend the time and energy on my product. So um, while it's a good place to start, it's just one part and you can continue to grow it um, as we saw with the, that little periodic chart. Okay. Um, John, thank you very yeah. much. Um, very informative, very helpful. Um, there, I do have a couple of questions, but before we dive into those, uh, Beth Stoller from the Monroe Chamber has joined us and I think she wanted to put in a few words. So Beth, if Hi, you're Beth. there and want to have a board. Hi everybody. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, I was a little bit late. I was working with a client and I totally got onto the call late. So John, as always, you've done a fantastic presentation. It's unbelievable all the things that they that there is to learn on, on a business side to be able to market your business properly. Um, on behalf of the chamber, the Edith Wheeler Library and SCORE, I wanna thank everybody for attending today's Lunch and Learn. We've come together for the last four years to put on great presentations like John's today. I'd like to remind you to mark your calendar. Our next Lunch and Learn is on Friday, October 22nd. And then we will have one in December as well. On October 22nd, our next speaker is gonna be Stephen Robert from Bedrock Credit, who will be here to talk about personal and business credit and how to run and grow your business. And like I said, John is a wealth of information. I'd just like to take a minute to thank John. He's a great friend and vendor to us at the Monroe Chamber. So in addition to all the marketing knowledge he has, John is our website guru. He's our technical advisor. And without him, the Chamber's what new website wouldn't have happened. So if you need marketing help, John's your man. And if you need website help, John's your man. Thank you very much. I apologize for being late and I'll turn it back to you guys. Great. Thank you, Beth. Um, John, I, pardon my not knowing, but what exactly is ISO 9000? <laughs> so ISO 9000 was something that was introduced in the manufacturing world back in the uh, early 80s. It's a way of tracking everything you do, documenting it, and creating work instructions so that you can ensure that you do things consistently over time. And uh, I took my ISO training, I applied it to marketing uh, so that we're you know, marketing the same way all the time and making the adjustments to improve as you go by basically analyzing, documenting it and uh, adjusting. Thank you. Um, that kind of segues into the, to the next question, which early on you were talking about how a business owner um, starts to refocus his, um, what he has to work on as a business grows and changes. Mm -hmm. Um, how, as you do that refocusing, how do, you, how do you think or recommend that the small business owner who now has people doing work for him or her keep track of, what, of all those other things that they were doing? Yeah, so um, a lot of it has to do with looking at what your success has been as a business owner, um, where, where your, your audience um, resonated with what you're saying or what you're offering and then figuring out a way to duplicate that so that someone that you hire will be able to do it the same way or as close as possible to it um you know what what happens with a lot with businesses that you know we we trust the businesses that are consistent um that we can you know count on getting the same consistent experience wherever we go and it doesn't matter whether i'm talking to joe today or i'm talking to betsy tomorrow uh, i know that they're both going to respond and and uh, be able to uh, resolve my issues the same way um so the documentation the putting it together and getting it online so that's not all up in your head um you know writing it out creating a presentation that everybody uses um those are the, you know, those are the main ways to be able to, to start to, to escalate from being the only person out there representing your business to being able to have a team out there to represent your business. So as that business grows and you start to do the advertising, as you had said early on, mm -hmm. what do you recommend as either a dollar amount or a percentage yep. for allocating to advertising? Yep. So um, again, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy, so I like to break things down. And we look at what we uh, anticipate our sales, the, the sales number that we want to get to. And we generally will recommend somewhere between 5 to 20% of that should be dedicated towards your marketing and your sales activity. 
Um, in the past, there was a marketing silo and there was a sales silo and each would have their own budgets. Uh, now, marketing and sales, a lot of it has blended together. Um, and there are times when, especially in the e-commerce world, that it's your marketing that's going to get all the, the budget because the sales activity is basically just managing a shopping cart. Um, and there's other times when it's a very consultative sale uh, that the marketing is just a lead finder, but the sales activity is very personal and very, uh, you know, has to get very specific for what that client's application is. But somewhere between five to 20% of your annual sales budget should be going towards your sales and marketing. 5% is more for stable environments where there's a lot of name recognition. There's a lot of, of people out there that are already um, you know, familiar with you. 20% is when you're growing or trying to get into a different market. Well, thank you. Um, clearly, the work that you do has you up to your elbows in internet and social media and web design. How much time do you recommend that the small business owner invest in social media? Because it's so easy to get so deep into it that you don't end up doing the work that you do. So social media, um, that really depends upon what type of business you're in and who your audience. If, if your audience is on social media and um, that's where they live, then you're going to spend a lot more time on there. If your audience isn't on social media, um, you know, if you're dealing mostly with corporate uh, environment people, you may not spend a lot of time on Facebook. Or if you're dealing with, uh, you know, um, people who are in the construction world, uh, you may not be spending a lot of time on Pinterest or on um, Instagram. That being said, uh, when it comes to the hours, I, I hear this a lot of people when they're just starting off and they say, okay, we can't afford to be spending you know, thousands of dollars on our marketing. If we wanted to do it ourselves, how much time should we be spending? I use the same kind of uh, ratio. Look at how much time you spend on a week on your business and somewhere between five to 20% of that time should be focused on the marketing. Um, and most of the time, if you don't have the money to do it, and you're, not really sure, you're really spending about 20% of your time. So if you are a small business owner and you're only spending 40 hours uh, a week, you should be spending, you know, 20% um, of that time should be spent on the marketing side of it. Thank you. Um, also in your presentation, you, you had mentioned big data. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on when, uh, when big data transitions from gathering this information to an, um, an intrusion and profiteering off of your personal information and how do people avoid that? Mm. Um, I would say that gathering data of any type becomes an intrusion and a profiteering uh, opportunity. Um, now in order for any one, whether even as was back in the days of the, you know, the vacuum salesman, um, they would gather information and then use that during their sales pitch. You know, how, how many kids you have, how, how many pets you have, things like this. So sure. all of it is, uh, is, is an intrusion into your life. People are gathering things without, often without your knowledge and they are using it to figure out how to, how to pitch to you. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing though because you're getting the messages and the opportunities are being presented to you that are applicable to your situation. Um, when they say that, you know, we know, we're not gonna use any personalization or any data gathering at all, it means that I'm gonna hear every single message um, because the sales, the, the marketing groups, the companies, they're not gonna reduce the amount of messaging. They're gonna say, all right, everyone needs to hear it because I have no idea who's hearing it. So I'll hear everything from the you know, people who are uh, gluten-free uh, dieters to the people who are going on ski trips. Um, so I think that you know, the gathering of the information and using that to help modify the message and make sure I'm only seeing what's appropriate to me, that that makes a lot of sense. On the other side, along with that, is that there are people who will always take it to, to an advantage. Um, and it's up to the people who are gathering the information to basically cleanse it so that it's not so connected to the exact person. Um, so that, you know, someone can't say, okay, John Dupree, I see, you know, this is what he's done all the day and they got big brother looking down on you. So uh, the let, let's, the, the final question that I had uh, is of course the 900 pound gorilla of big data. And the question is, how does the small real retailer compete with Amazon? So 
Amazon has a lot of trust for some reason in this world. People think, oh, if I buy it from Amazon, you know, I, I know I'm going to get it in two days and I know what the return policies are. You have to look at what it is that people like about Amazon and be able to offer the same or a better experience. And then look at the things that people don't like about Amazon. They can't talk to anybody. Um, that there's no face-to-face, -face, there's no personalization. And now there's an awful lot of fake information out there. Um, where what they're getting isn't exactly what was seen on the screen. You hear about it all the time. So if you're a small business owner, look at the things that people want. They want the return policies. They want the quick shipping. They want the, you know, the, the, the easy ordering aspect of it. And then add to that by saying, you know, you know, here's what your product are. You can come in and look at it before I ship it to you. Uh, I, can, I can send you a live video of it if, if it's out of state and you can't come to me. And I can work with you on um, you know, your, you know, what it exactly is their needs and make sure that this is a proper fit before you decide to purchase it. There's all these types of personalization that Amazon doesn't do. And a small business owner can really take advantage of that. Okay. Um, had another question come in. Mm -hmm. uh, does your firm focus on any specific social media platform as part of your offering for marketing services? Yeah. So, um, Social media, again, is, is a tool. Um, it's, it's a communication device to where your audience is. So I will look at the different uh, tools that are out there and figure out what audience they are and what's appropriate use for them. I'll recommend to people, you know, have they looked at this area? Have they looked at that place? But if somebody wants to be using a social media to, uh, platform on a continuous basis um, and they want to get the message out there, I'm not the, the best person to offer that. Um, it's, there's, there's a lot of people who know the ins and outs of social media. They can do it faster and cheaper and easier than I'll be able to do it. Um, so I, I do have people that I recommend um, for when someone says, you know, I want to, you know, I think it should be on Facebook or LinkedIn or, or so forth. Then I'll direct them over to the appropriate uh, social media manager that's able to handle that. Great. Uh, last call on questions, anyone? And uh, I will ramble on slowly to say um, <laughs> thank you very much, John. Um, like to thank the Monroe Chamber of Commerce and the Monroe Library in planning this webinar with SCORE. And as a reminder, a recording of this webinar and the materials will be available within a couple of days on the fairfieldcounty.score.org website. Please check our website, fairfieldcounty.score.org, for information on upcoming webinars. Again, SCORE offers free individual counseling, so please use the link on screen. Do you have that screen with the, uh, the three value adds again, John? I know it was the second one at the beginning. Um, yeah. Use the link on the screen or visit our website and click Request a Mentor. We are available for sessions by phone, email, or video these days. Also, please fill out your evaluations that will be sent at the end of the webinar. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar. And in closing, a big thank you to Monroe and John for presenting. Have a nice rest of the day, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone.